Alright, this is the second of three videos on China under Mao in the 1950s. This video in particular covers the period of 54 to 57. Um, it should be pretty brief, actually. So by 1954, plans to industrialize China were well underway. Um, at the same time, Chairman Mao grew concerned, though, about potential rivals within the party. He claimed that two provincial leaders of Manchuria and Shandong had established independent kingdoms. They were pressured and harassed in prison until one committed suicide and the other was out of power. Other members were similarly harassed in these party purges of 54, um, which led to Mao further consolidating his power over the party. In 1953, Joseph Stalin died, and eventually the new leader of the Soviet state emerged, Nikita Khrushchev. With the death of Stalin, Khrushchev began the process of de-Stalinization in the Soviet Union, with Khrushchev denouncing the style of leadership Stalin had exhibited, purging the party of opposition and building a cult. Mao took all this as a personal attack and began to make moves to distance himself from the Soviet Union further, as well as the criticisms leveled at him for running a personal cult. In April of 1955, representatives from 29 governments of Asia and Africa met in Indonesia at Bandung to discuss peace and decolonization. With Stalin's death in the Soviet Union, Mao and China now stood poised to become the global leader of anti-imperialism and anti-Western thought in the world. Further, the Soviet Union had just sent tanks and military force into Hungary to crack down on anti-communist uprisings there that provoked outrage worldwide. Mao watched all of this approvingly. He saw that the West did little to help the anti-communist in Hungary and realized that as long as communism didn't interfere too much with the West, he could get away with his policies at home. In early 1957, with the slogan, let a hundred flowers bloom, let a hundred schools of thought contend, Mao began encouraging open criticism in the party and the country. He assumed that most intellectuals were now supportive of the party and the, uh, of the Communist Party, and he wanted to let them criticize the government, hoping it would lead to some arrogant CCP bureaucrats being taken down a notch and further consolidating his own authority. He also thought the government was too full of um, too many rightist and capitalist roaders, as he called them, following the capitalist road of thought. At first, criticisms were mild, but eventually people began to write about Mao and his rule. At this point, Mao felt it had gotten too far and shut the whole campaign down, declaring it finished after a few weeks. Immediately thereafter, the anti-rightist campaign began, in which those who had criticized were arrested for going too far and punishing them. Future leader of China, Deng Xiaoping, actually led this effort. Anyone who had dared speak out against Mao was arrested and imprisoned. Universities were shut down. Experts began to be disregarded as Mao said that the common people of China knew more than these so-called experts did. This would be an ominous foreshadowing for what was to come in the last part of the 1950s. Intellectuals were encouraged to work in the countryside as part of their re-education and engage in self-criticism sessions publicly. This event pushed intellectuals further from Mao, as they saw this all as a trap from the beginning. Was the 100 Flowers campaign a trick? There are some historians that say yes, and others that say no. Mao genuinely felt that people liked him and would not speak out against him and was genuinely surprised when they did and thus shut it down, but to others it looked like a trap from the beginning to kind of root out any uh, possible opponents. What followed the 100 Flowers campaign in 1957, though, was to be the most monumental and significant undertaking of Mao's career as leader of China. <laughs> 